In this short video, I want to describe the results of a recent drug trial that's caused a lot of controversy because of the particular drug and the disease it was treating. I can't name the drug or the disease because YouTube would immediately ban the video if I did, but anybody who follows me on Twitter or Getter will know what they are. But the data and the results highlight a critical statistical issue that's common in many medical and other trials. So the data here, independently of what treatment it's talking about, is incredibly interesting in highlighting this issue, which is the issue of the dubious value of p-values and classical statistical hypothesis testing. So this was a randomized controlled trial trying to determine if treatment T reduces mortality in people with disease D. As with any randomized controlled trial, people were randomly assigned to a so-called treatment group or control group. So 241 people randomly selected ended up getting the treatment, that's a so-called treatment group, and three of them died, that's 1.24%. 249 people didn't get the treatment, they're in the control group, and 10 of them died, that's 4.02%. We know there are no direct adverse reactions to treatment, so it's considered safe, and so the risk ratio for the treatment T on disease D, which is simply the percentage of those who die with the treatment divided by the percentage of those who die without the treatment is 0.308. And because that risk ratio is less than one, the data supports the hypothesis that the treatment T reduces mortality risk, because obviously the mortality rate in the treatment group is lower than the mortality rate in the control group. But the question is, is it sufficiently statistically significant to recommend use of the treatment? Before we go into that question, look at the data here. Would you be happy if your loved one with the disease were denied treatment T? With classical statistical significance testing, we start with a null hypothesis that the drug, the treatment in this case, does not reduce mortality. Now, because of the sample sizes and relatively small number of deaths overall, this null hypothesis, it turns out when you apply these classical statistical tests, cannot be rejected at the 1% significant level. That's the so-called p-value of point. Not one. What that means is there's a greater than 1% chance that we would have got this observed data if the treatment had no effect at all. This is actually the real study conclusion in the paper that described this study, said that the mortality rate in the treatment group and control group are similar. Well, is that a fair statement? Well, that's something to think about, and that the treatment cannot be recommended. But of course, the concerns are, well, that p-value is something arbitrary. What would have been the case if it was 5%? And of course, the conclusion hides all of the important information about the likely effectiveness of the treatment, because there's clearly information there which is not contained in that conclusion. So what I'm now going to describe is the so-called Bayesian approach to hypothesis testing, which is far more informative. In particular, it provides full information about how much the data should revise our belief in the probability that the treatment is effective. And I'm going to do that by actually demonstrating the model in action. So here's our Bayesian model. It's actually a Bayesian network. At the top here, we've got these probability of death with the treatment and probability of death without the treatment. And these are defined before we start looking at any data. And in the absence of any previous data, we are assuming that each of these probabilities is the same and that each of them is equally likely to be any value between 0 and 1. So you can see these, this is defined as a so-called uniform 0 to 1 distribution, and we've got the same prior probability distribution here. The number of deaths that you'd observe in the treatment group is going to be dependent on the number that are in the treatment group and the probability of death with treatment. So the smaller that probability is, the lower the number of deaths that you'd expect here. And that expected number is a distribution that's defined as the binomial distribution, where the number of trials is a so-called, is in this case, the number of people in the treatment group, and the probability of success here is actually the probability of death with the treatment. And we've got exactly the same thing over here with the number of deaths in the control group, number of people in the trials, number of people in the control group, and the probability of success is the probability of death without the treatment. Okay, so the risk ratio is simply going to be the probability of death with the treatment divided by the probability of death without treatment. And we can also determine from that, once we know what that is, the probability that risk ratio is going to be less than one. Now, because the risk ratio potentially involves division by zero, it's actually better, more accurate. So you don't get any loss of, you don't get any potential errors from zero divisions. Talk about whether 
this probability is simply lower than that probability. So we're just asking if the probability of death with treatment is lower than the probability of death without treatment, that's going to be true, otherwise it's going to be false. So what we're going to do now is enter the observed data. So we observed three deaths in the treatment group and we observed 10 deaths in the control group. And we're going to run the model and see what happens with these distributions. So you can see that they've been updated. We can now look at the revised so-called posterior probability of death with treatments. It's an uncertain probability distribution. It's got a median value of 0.0156, so that's 1.516%. So it's slightly different from simply dividing the 3 by the 241 because it's taken account of the prior uniform assumption here. And we've got the upper and lower bounds of this, so it's a 95% confidence interval range, which incidentally is different from the confidence interval range that you get from classical statistical testing. So don't think that these are the same. But that's going from 0.4% to 3.5%. And the probability of death without treatment, that has a median value of 0.0426, so that's 4.26%. And the range there is 2.2% to 7.25%. And of course, we get the risk ratio, and here's the critical thing. Now, the median value is 0.356. But the lower and upper bounds here are 0.095 to 1.0571. So it's the upper bound is just above 1. And I say, although these bounds are slightly different in the Bayesian approach, it's the fact that it goes slightly above 1 here. That means there's a small probability, just over 3% probability, that the risk ratio is above 1. But we're still pretty confident there's a 97% probability that the risk ratio is less than 1. And the same as there's an you know, almost 97% probability that probability of death with the treatment is lower than the probability of the death without treatment. So that's the full probability information we're given there. If a slightly higher p-value had been chosen, this would have been statistically significant. If we simply had observed one extra death in the control arm, then let's see how things change. We can see that the probability that the risk ratio is less than 1 is now less than 2%. And in fact, the 95% confidence interval here is actually, the upper bound is below 1, 0.94. And if indeed we'd seen one less death here, this, is, this would be the equivalent, one of the deaths in the control group being wrongly assigned to the treatment group. So that's, a, again, a, not that big a change. And now there's less than 1% probability that the risk ratio is less than 1. So this is showing the, the power and the flexibility of the Bayesian approach as an alternative to classical statistics and the richer information that it provides, which suggests that the treatment is rather good. Mm-hmm.